Welcome to Wednesday Bible study. <clears throat> Today is our fourth Bible study from the book of Hosea. Uh, I am enjoying the preparation of my studies and I hope you are enjoying listening. It has been real blessing, especially uh, today's study that I um, took. Hosea chapter one, verse six and seven. Uh, as we said last time, we are taking one kid at a time. You know, Hosea has three kids. So we talked about Jezreel last Wednesday. Today we are going to talk about Lord Rohama. Lord, I don't even know, even know how to pronounce it. The, the Google doesn't give the correct pronunciation because I think Google doesn't know Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's pray before we start. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our dear Heavenly Father, your word is light for us and life. We pray that as we uh, listen and as we speak your word, Lord, I pray that our lives will be filled with your grace and with your blessing. Help that our minds will not be distracted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay. I, I'm loving this book. I hope you do the same. Uh, you, you enjoy listening to it, and uh, by God's grace, we started a couple weeks ago, <clears throat> and we are still in the first chapter of it, and today is our third. I think I messed up with the slides. No problem. We can, we can do it without slides. I, I'm used to of that. I haven't forgotten my dad skill. Okay, so today we are going to look at uh, <clears throat> our, this was our third study. Oh, anyway. Okay, today is our fourth study, uh, about two verses, chapter one, verse six and seven. And uh, you remember last, our first study was about introduction of Hosea. Okay, now we are on the right. Thank you, that's good. Okay, our first study was about introduction. We, we learned about Hosea. Where did he come from, what he did, where he was preaching, where he was prophesying. And the second study was about the strange commandment that the Lord gave to Hosea to go and marry a woman, a girl, who is living actively a sinful life. And our third study was about symbolism of Jezreel, who was Hosea's son, first son. And we studied that all these three uh, kids were named by God. And every kid's name expressed a specific message to the nation. And uh, last, in last study, we heard that Jezreel was uh, Hosea's son, and his name was to communicate the idea of God's judgment, not on the entire nation, but only on the house of Jehu, which means God was speaking about sending a judgment on the upper level of society, just the uh, palace people, the kings and uh, his house. And today, our study is about the second kid of Hosea. Her name is Lorohama. So let's read, uh, open your Bible, uh, Hosea chapter one and verse six and seven. And she conceived again and bear a daughter. And God said unto him, call her name Lorohama, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah and will save them by the Lord their God and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses, nor by horsemen. There are three people in this uh, verse. Hosea, Lorohama, and uh, Israel, and Judah. And if we look at, if at first glance, we can, we can just know some things. So let, maybe a brief overview if we look at this, we know these things. 
Lord Ohama is born and God wants to send this message from, from her name. And that is that he's not having mercy anymore. No more mercy for Israel. <clears throat> and he said, I am sending this nation away. These people will be taken away. Complete judgment. But he said, on Judah, I will have mercy. And God said, I will save them. Not by human efforts, not by the weapons human produce, but I will save them by my power. Now, when I read these two verses, <clears throat> the first, at first glance, I thought, well, this is not what God's what God looks like. God appears to be a human in these two verses. You know, we, we human like to say, I hate him, I love him. I favor him, I don't favor him. And I just, I raised up some questions which, which were bothering. And uh, we are going to look at those questions today. And I believe that we will be able to learn what God is teaching us in these verses. So the first question is, why would God not have mercy on Israel and have mercy on Judah? Why would God say, okay, <clears throat> I like Don. I'll have mercy on him, but I will not like, I will not have mercy on Farouk. Is there possibility that God can do that? Is God's mercy for some people and for some not? Let's ask, what are the reasons why? So the first reason I came up with was, God has a free will, doesn't he? We like to talk about us, us. We, we say, oh, I have a free will. I can do whatever I want. Why can't God have free will? Exodus chapter 33, verse 19. He says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Doesn't it express the idea that God has a free will? But then I said, no, that doesn't go with God's character. He has free will. But that doesn't mean that he can pick and choose people. But he did. Malachi chapter 1, verse 2 and 3 says, God loved Jacob, but he hated Esau. Does it mean he has free will? Maybe he has, maybe he doesn't. I, I don't really know. But all I know that he's, he's all wise, he's all powerful, and he's all, he has all the knowledge of future, past, and so on, on his knowledge, on the basis of his knowledge, he can decide where he needs to send his favor and where he needs to keep his favor. In that sense, we can say he has free will. Anyways, maybe, next reason. Israel is stubborn, they're not listening. They're always persecuting and killing the prophets. So this could be the reason why God is taking away his mercy from them. Maybe yes, maybe not. <clears throat> we're not sure. Because Judah was not good either. They were also not doing well. And then I thought maybe, maybe, oh maybe God has free will, maybe Israel is not doing, uh, is stubborn, they're not listening. So this could be the reason, or maybe third reason we can think of. Maybe God is comparing Judah and Israel and God said, okay, just let's weigh them. The one who is doing better, I will show him mercy. The one who is not doing better, I will just take away my mercy. Does that work? Does that how God works? Maybe not, or maybe yes. <laughs> because we believe that his mercy is not based on works. I do not have to be good to obtain his mercy. His mercy is there all the time. 
<clears throat> in other words, in our religious language, in our spiritual language, we can say, okay, God's mercy is unconditional. It is for everybody. Now, is that true? It depends how you look at it. Is God's mercy unconditional? Is God's mercy, is God's love unconditional? It depends from which perspective you look at. Now, God's mercy and God's love, they are unconditional. From his side, not from my side. That means <clears throat> that his mercy and his love are available to every human being, to everybody who will take it. He doesn't, he doesn't just throw his mercy on everybody. He doesn't just impose his mercy or love on anybody. If my son is not willing to receive my love, what would I do? There is no way that I can impose my mercy on him. There is no way that I can, I can just share my love on him when he's not willing to receive it. In exactly the same way, God's mercy and God's love, they are unconditional from his side. So what is happening here? We'll look at this. I think <clears throat> in order to understand this more uh, clearly, we need to look at this, look at the mercy of God. When, when you think about mercy, what, what, what are we asking? The most, my most favorite Psalm is Psalm 51. That's the Psalm when, when David sinned, um, he, he committed adultery and he tried to hide it and he played it well actually. Only God could find out that he did it. And God sent Nathan. Nathan told him a story. And at the end of the story, Nathan asked him. And uh, David confessed. And after his confession, he wrote Psalm, 100 and, uh, Psalm 51. Psalm 51 starts like this. He says, Lord, have mercy on me. And uh, when he was pleading for God's mercy, he said, cast me not away from thy presence. When he was asking for mercy, these are some of the things he was asking for. He said, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit away from me. And then he was saying, restore the joy of salvation. And then he said, deliver me from guilt. So when he was seeking mercy, he was asking for these things. I think I need to change the slide. So our understanding of mercy is different. Usually when we ask mercy, we are asking, asking for some things, for example. Usually our mercy, when we ask for mercy, we are, we are asking for avoidance of consequences. We are asking God to forgive us, um, save us from the consequences. Uh, you might remember the parable of Jesus Christ where, where somebody has, to, has a debt that he had to pay and he cannot pay. And his, his master calls him and he is ready to send him to jail, to prison gather all his family and send them to prison. And he pleads, he said, have mercy on me. And his master forgives all his debts. That means he was seeking for, he was asking him not to, not to face the consequences. He, he just say, please don't let me face the consequences. And again, when we ask mercy, usually we are asking the hard circumstances turn into easy ones. And maybe sometimes when we are asking mercy, we are asking bad things turn into good. But as I said, 
when David was asking for mercy, he was not asking for these things. Interestingly, in Psalm 51, he didn't ask for the avoidance of consequences. He was asking for the presence of God. Take not away your presence from me and take not away your Holy Spirit from me. So what is, what is mercy in the Bible? <clears throat> what is mercy? There are two different words used in the Bible for mercy. And both of them are used here in Lamentation chapter 2, verse 22 and 23. It reads like this. If the Lord's mercy, if the Lord's, it is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassion fail not, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. So I, I believe that the mercy according to Bible is not a feeling of sympathy. Based on these two words, there's the, the, the first word here used is chasid. When it says, it is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, the, the Hebrew word chasid is used. And it is not translated as mercy. Many times it, it is, but most of the time it is translated as loving kindness. Loving kindness, kindness, and uh, Jeremiah says that it is because his mercies that we are not consumed. And when we read these two verses, there is another word, we will come to that. <clears throat> And these two Hebrew words communicate two ideas. The first one is relationship. The equivalent word of chasid is agape in the New Testament. And uh, it communicates the idea of relationship, relationship and covenant. And when Jeremiah says, okay, we are not consumed because of his mercies. He's saying we are not consumed because of his covenantal love, because of his love, because of his loving kindness. It's, uh, when, when we read it, uh, it says you are not consumed. Consumed is a very interesting word. It means to finish, to destroy, to go away and never come back. It's the same word uh, used in Genesis chapter 47, verse 15. You remember the story. When there was famine, all the Egyptians, they brought their money to Moses and they said, give us food. And there was a time when all the money was gone. And they came to uh, Joseph and they said, and they said, we have no money. Our money is finished. And when their money was gone, uh, verse, uh, chapter 47, verse 15 says, when their money was gone, when their money was consumed, they came to Joseph and they said, hey, here is our land. Take this and give us food. So basically, Jeremiah is saying, that you are not utterly destroyed. God has punished you, but he has not destroyed you completely because of his agape love, because of his covenantal love. And he says, this is the relationship which is keeping you, which is making you, uh, which is, uh, on the basis of which I am not destroying you completely. And there is another word which is used for God's mercy. And this is a very interesting word. Racham. Hosea chapter 1 verse 6. We read that daughter is born 
and God said, name her Lo Ruhama. Lo is negative sense. Like in English you say unwanted, unfaithful, unbeliever. So in, in Hebrew language, Lo is un, unfaithful, unpitied. So God said, call her Lo Ruhama. There is no mercy. But in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, God said, okay, I will, I will have mercy. Interestingly, this word is a very powerful word. It has three letters, and this is how it reads in, uh, in English. And uh, Lamentation chapter 3, verse 25, the second line, where it says, because his compassion fail not, word compassion in Hebrew is Raham. Interestingly, in Urdu language, we have the same word, Raham. Raham means mercy, Rehi means merciful, so it's, it's the same, uh, same word. But the interesting thing is this, that this same word with the same letters, Hebrew letters, Raham, is somewhere else is translated as womb. For example, in Genesis chapter 29, verse 31, it reads like this. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, Raham. But Rachel was barren. And then Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, it says, And God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her and opened her womb, opened her raham. It's, we ha it, in Urdu language, we have the same word for raham, womb and raham. And these, both of these two words, which are translated in English as mercy, they give us the idea of two things. The first one is God's unbreakable covenant, God's love, which compels him to, to save his people, to keep his people. And Raham gives the idea of God's protection, perfect protection. Now, if you look at these two words, they look the same. They're same three letters. And Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, God says, Before you came out of your mother's womb, Rechem, I sanctified you. So what, what, is the, what, what is the mercy of God in the Bible? I believe it is God's love and it's God's protection. Uh, I, I took this picture for you. This is Raham, in which the baby stays and grows. I was reading somewhere that it is one of the most protected place for a baby. Even, even if a mother dies, the baby will still be alive for, for maybe 30 minutes. So that means God is telling us and Israelites, you are in my Ram, the idea to give us the concept of his mercy. Now, when God says, I am not going to be merciful for you, what is he talking about? What is he saying? God is saying that I am taking away the protection you have for me. Do, do you know a man who was protected by God and God took away his protection and suddenly he was attacked by Satan. His everything was taken, taken away. His name was Job. Do you remember Job said, oh, nobody can harm him because you have a hedge of protection. That's the hedge of protection around all of us. In general, God protects all of us. 
in specific. The believers, they are close to God's heart. We are protected by his presence and his, his, uh, his grace. So this is the realm. When God said, I am not going to have no more mercy. He said, no more mercy for Israel. He's saying, because they don't want to live by my rules, by my mercy, by my protection, I'm just letting them go. God is basically saying, okay, this is my house. And if you don't want to live by my rules, you are happy to go out. Do you remember these sentences? Have you heard them somewhere? We tell our kids when they're 18 and they don't obey, we tell them to go. We tell them, hey, this is our house. This is my house. I'm head of this house. And if you don't abide with my rules, you are most welcome to leave. Remember, the door is open. You can come back to live by my rules. This is what God is saying. This is what God is telling the Israelites. Okay, you don't want to live by my rules in my country, in my land. You are, you are free to go. But when you come back, you have to remember. You have to remember that you need my mercy. That you need my rules. You need to live by my rules. That's what God is telling Sometimes God just let go people. He will let his children go in the world. And that doesn't break the relationship. That only breaks the fellowship. My son is ready to go to GCU, Grand Canyon. I don't know how many miles from here. <clears throat> he will be gone. But that doesn't mean our relationship will be gone. Our fellowship will have a pause. Maybe three years, four years when he, he's graduated, he'll come back. This is what is happening. When God said, listen, Israel, I am not having any more mercy for you. I am taking away my protection in exactly the same way he did to Job. To Job, he did for some other purpose, but for Israel, he took away his mercy because of some other reasons. Maybe for their training, maybe for their corrections, maybe for, for them to go out in the wilderness and find out what the life is, what the real life is. God said, okay, you don't really want to live by my rules. You're welcome to go. Leave. And when you come back, come back with the full assurance that you need me. That's what God is telling them to do. And Psalm chapter 119 verse 75 says, <clears throat> I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right. And with faithfulness, you have afflicted me. When he was saying, I'm taking my mercy back. He's, he's in his faithfulness, he is letting them afflict. Psalm 119, 71, verse number 71 says, it is good for me that I have, that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. God let his people go. He said, okay, go. One of the attributes of love is to let people go. Love doesn't force, love doesn't, it, it doesn't bind people, it doesn't do anything forcefully. The attributes of love is, if you love the person, let him go. And when he comes back, he will come with full force of his love. And this is what God is doing here. He said, you can go and you will know that you have not mercy. The absence of God's mercy was to be seen in the exile. 
in the absence of their land, in, in the absence of the blessing which God had bestowed upon them. You remember Jesus was talking about the devil? Jesus said, his work is to come and steal and destroy. And when God's mercy was taken away, this is what happened with the Israelites. The devil came, he stole, he destroyed, and he made captives. The book of Malachi says when they came back, they were reverence, they had God's reverence, they were obeying him, they didn't have any idols. This is what they learned in their, in their time of, in their time when, when they didn't have God's mercy. Now, verse number seven. Verse number seven, God said, but I will have mercy upon the house of Judah and will save them by, by their God and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, nor by horse, nor by horseman. Now, when you compare these Israel and Judah, you will know that there, where God's mercy is present. When God's mercy is taken away, the Assyrians, they attack Israel and scatter them in, in, in the world. But in Judah, where God's mercy still exists, they are protected, not by human efforts, but by, but by the Lord. In what way did God show mercy to Judah? Israel was taken in captivity by 722 BC, and Judah was taken in captivity 587 BC. So God gave them basically 133 or maybe 122 years to live in their land, to enjoy more of goodness, God's goodness, and maybe see what God is doing with Israel and learn their lesson. They didn't learn their lesson from Israel, they should have, but they didn't. Our problem is that we don't learn from others' mistake. We just want to make our own mistakes and learn. That's what Judah did. So in God's mercy, God gave them 133 years to live in the land, Judah, where they could worship in the temple, where they could offer the sacrifices, where they had priests, where they had the Levites, where they, the temple was just in front of them. They could just go in and out. That was God's mercy for them. But when it says God will save them without human weapons, it happened in 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 18 and 19. You know the story of the king Sanherib? Sanherib? Judah was surrounded by the army. Nobody was allowed to go in and out. The country was scared. They know what is happening. Sanherib was going to kill them and take over this country. Just one night, one angel came and he killed 185,000 soldiers in just one night, one angel. No sword was used, no bow was used, no horseman was used, nothing. Next morning when everybody woke up, there were corpse. The army of Sinharib went back. The people of God, they were saved. As Hosea said, not by man's power, not by bow and arrow, not by sword. He said, this is the, I would say, fulfillment of what, he, what Hosea prophesied in chapter one, verse seven. The Lord said, no mercy. That means no protection. Where there was mercy, there was protection. Where there was no mercy, there was no protection. Israel, God to Israel, he said, I have no more mercy for you. 
Look at the words. He said, I have no more mercy, which means previously they had mercy. But at some point, God decided that these people do not need my mercy. He took it away. Wherever God shows his mercy, something happens. And wherever God takes away his mercy, something happens. The presence and absence of God's mercy is very visible in the circumstances and in the lives of any individual. This is why I mean, when God was saying, when Jesus was talking to his disciple, he said, you, you are in, in my hand and in my father's hand. Nobody can pluck you out from my hands. That was God's mercy. That was his mercy that he was talking about. Now, here is the application. Application part. <clears throat> Israel had mercy. Okay. God's mercy is his covenantal relationship and protection. Let's value it. Keep it very precious. Keep it very precious. That means <clears throat> every day when we are walking with Christ, when we are living our Christian life, always remember that we are protected by his mercy. I remember when we first came here, 2017, we were invited by one of our families. And uh, our dear sister was very afraid from demons. And she asked me, um, can, can demons hurt anybody they want? I said, no, why? Why would God allow demons to go and hurt anybody they want? If Satan had that kind of permission, nobody would be one in one piece. He would go out and des destroy as many as he can. Overall, God has protected everybody in his mercy. But as a believer, he is, the Bible says that he is our refuge and he is our rock. He is our refuge. He is our shelter. In the time of trouble, when, when, whenever there is, uh, there is a troublesome time, whenever there is worry, he is, he hides us in. There are many, many pictures in the Bible which are shown about his mercy. When, when Jesus uh, wa, just entered Jerusalem, he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times I wanted to gather you like a hen gathers her cheeks under his wings. That's the mercy of God. Do you remember Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. And God said, nobody can see me. But if you come, there is a cliff. Hide yourself in that cliff. And I will put my hand at the door of that cliff. And I'll pass by and then you can see my back. That is God's mercy hiding us in that cliff where the door is blocked by his own hand. That is when God is saying, Israel, I don't have any more mercy for you. He is taking away his hand that has blocked that uh, cliff. I will pray that that we all have this very strong sense of God's mercy in our lives. There are many times, I mean, we, we just go about our life. We don't even think about it. But there is no, there is no life. We, we can't even one step further without his mercy. He has surrounded us from all over. He has just covered us from all over. In exactly the same way as mother's womb covers the baby and nobody can hurt. Let's pray. 
Our dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you are loving and the relationship we have with you through Jesus Christ cannot be broken. And when you save us, you save us for eternal life. And you, you give us uh, our refuge. You give us uh, protection against sin and against devil, against his scheme. And you help us walk the life you want us to walk. Thank you. Thank you very much for loving us so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.